Hi, everybody. This morning, I heard Oprah in a television program say, uh, let's change the agony to joy. And I thought, wow, that is a mantra I could live by, including down with entropy and up with light. And here is my joyful sidekick who does bring me joy. And I love his uh, brother too, but his brother uh, sometimes likes the lights and sometimes makes it into a game. And tonight Fluffy is downstairs playing with a new toy. And I'd hoped with the lights that you guys could see how this little guy's eyes, they are the color of the sky and they're hidden inside of this dark mask. And he is Sometimes he stares like you would think some advanced yogi. And I feel like that I get uh, all kinds of communications from him. And he's just a mystical kitty. And I thought this morning when Oprah said, we need more joy, I agree. And that I hope that every single one of you out there around the world in this very, very troubled time, from viruses to geophysical changes, that you pick up your kitty or your puppy or whatever makes your heart feel like it has pressure in your chest and you know that your soul is relating to the soul of another life form with love. If we could just do that every day, it might help this whole planet. And so dear, dear chocolate, I love you so much. Your beautiful blue eyes that nobody can see. I'm going to put you down so that I can talk about some important news. I love you. Now, today, on February 26, 2020, at 5 p.m. Mountain Time here in Albuquerque, and 8 a.m. Thursday on the other side of the world in Wuhan, China, there were 81,406 confirmed cases of COVID-19 registered on our planet, 2,772 deaths, and 30,401 people who have been sick with the coronavirus and have recovered. That's something good to hang on. The Wuhan coronavirus belongs to the same family of coronavirus diseases as SARS and MERS. Coronaviruses circulate among animals such as pigs, bats, snakes, and the scaly anteater known as a pangolin. But now the COVID-19 new coronavirus is spreading through the air among humans and changing itself to adapt to each new human host. And this microbe, only one twenty thousandth of a millimeter, so small it goes right through N95 respirator face masks, has spread to 48 countries now around the world, including Italy, where in one week there has been 470 confirmed cases and 12 deaths. Other European countries now battling COVID-19 are Germany with 27 cases, France with 18 and two deaths, Spain with 13, the UK with 13, Austria with two, Croatia with three, Finland with two, Sweden with two, and Belgium with one. Across the Mediterranean from Europe to Africa, Algeria has its first confirmed case, a man who might have traveled from Italy. Egypt also has one COVID-19 case and moving closer into the Middle East, Iran reports 139 cases and 44 deaths, but there are rumblings that those numbers might be lower than the truth. Kuwait has 26, Bahrain has 33, United Arab Emirates has 13, Oman has four. And if you want to keep up daily with all of the countries of the world and the changing cases and death rates per country, go to worldameters.info forward slash coronavirus forward slash. On Monday, 
February 24th, the stock market reacted to a world teetering on recessions because of the new coronavirus impact on product supply chains. And the Dow Jones was down 1,031 points at Monday's close. And then yesterday, February 25th, Worried investors took the Dow down another 879 points by that close. Today, on February 26th, the Dow closed down another 122 points for a total of about 2,000 points down in three days because no one knows what the consequences of the COVID-19 coronavirus will be. The UK's BBC headlined on February 25th, quote, Coronavirus, world must prepare for pandemic, says World Health Organization, close quote. The headlines were over a photograph of Daegu City, South Korea, where hundreds of people lined up for face masks. Even more strongly, the American director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the CDC, Dr. Nancy Messonia, announced in a February 25th press conference, quote, it's not so much of a question if this will happen in the United States anymore, but a question of when this will happen. We are asking the American public to prepare for the expectation that this might be bad." Close quote. As in other nations, such as China, with at least 100 million people or more in Wuhan and many other cities in the largest lockdown in human history, authorities are warning there could be major disruptions to daily lives here in America as well because of forced quarantines at home and closed schools and offices to help the whole population survive if we actually move into epidemic, pandemic stages. Dr. Messonnier was echoed by Alex A. Azar, the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services. Yesterday, on February 25th, he spoke before a Senate committee and said, quote, this is an unprecedented, potentially severe health challenge globally. We cannot hermetically seal off the United States to a virus, and we need to be realistic about that. Last week, the FBI ordered $40,000 worth of hand sanitizer and face masks, quote, in case the coronavirus becomes a pandemic in the United States, close quote. And I think they mean epidemic per nation that is then a pandemic around the world. But America has only 30 million face masks available for distribution to the public. It is estimated that 300 million masks are needed for healthcare workers and ventilator facilities and hospitals if there is a major outbreak of the COVID-19 coronavirus here in the United States. This week, the Trump administration asked Congress for only $2.5 billion to fight this dangerous new coronavirus. The U.S. government asked for eight or more billion to fight outbreaks of SARS, MERS, and Ebola. Some good news. At the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, which has a special biocontainment unit, some patients from the Diamond Princess cruise ship are being treated with the antiviral drug remdesivir developed by Gilead Sciences. I was talking about that about two weeks ago, and now uh, let's pray that they are trying this remdesivir uh, on some of these actual patients, and hopefully, hopefully, they this will help and that we will get a new motion going forward. If they can't come up with a full vaccine, maybe, maybe there will be these a drug like this that could help immensely and cut down the death rates. And as this new coronavirus outbreak in Italy has spread, it has been the worst outside of Asia. 
and it keeps spreading along with new cases in Iran and South Korea. These signify that there is no coordinated global medical strategy to fight and contain the dangerous COVID-19 coronavirus that's now in 48 countries. Well, let's segue now from the agony of the unknown in global pandemic disease for a while to lightening our minds and souls with another world mystery. The strange metallic and other bizarre sounds that people around Earth have reported and even recorded on their cell phones since at least 2011. And it was after last week's broadcast with the eerie Anchorage, Alaska Metallic Mysteries that I received many emails about other strange unexplained sounds. And one was a haunting, almost growling sound on Sunday night, December 29th, 2019, only two months ago. The sender is an intelligent, active 72-year-old woman who lives in the small town of Medina in Bandera County, Texas, about 55 miles northwest of San Antonio. She has asked for anonymity, but wanted to share her experience because she does not understand, and neither do I, how something can sound loud and feel like it's right above you and around you, and yet she could see nothing but a clear star-filled sky. And her small dog, Teddy, never barked once. She couldn't believe it. But he had a deep warning growl in his throat for that night and for days afterward towards something unseen. Afterward, she searched YouTube for any strange sound like the one that surrounded her on December 29th, 2019. And what she selected, I am using in this Earth Files segment tonight with her approval as a close as we can get to what it was that she heard in Medina, Texas, December 29th, uh, two months ago. It was late in the evening, about 1230. I had taken my little dog out for the last time and we came in to get settled in for the evening and to go to sleep. And I just turned the lights off, TV off, laid down, and realized that I heard a noise that my first thought was it was a high wind. I thought that was really strange because I had just come from outside. It was a clear night. The stars were out. It was very cold. Which direction was the sound coming from? It was coming from the front of the house kind of southeast, the, the sound was kind of moving northwest. It was overhead, and it was very loud. It was moving slowly. My mind was just racing, you know, what is that? And I finally got up, and I ran out on the deck on the side of the house, and it felt like it was right above me, like it was just barely above the house. It felt really heavy really huge. I kept looking up in the sky. There was nothing there. Nothing was showing. There were no lights. There was no outline, no silhouette of anything. It sounded like a growl like a roar and then it trailed off in a growl at the end and it had a rhythm to it. I started counting the seconds as it would sound because it would make the sound and then it would stop for five seconds and then it would sound again for four to five seconds. I was so puzzled I couldn't even imagine what could be making a sound like that overhead. And then by the time I got my wits about me and thought, oh, my cell phone, ran back in and got it. And just as I stepped back outside, it was making the noise for the last time. It was like nothing I've ever experienced or ever heard. 
and I found it strange that my little dog never said a word, and the neighborhood dogs that bark at everything, there was no peep out of any of them. And I realized that animals can be so frightened that they don't say anything. What about your human neighbors? Did any neighbors hear anything? That night, there were no lights on anywhere. I didn't see anyone, you know, that was up at that time of night. But the next day, my neighbor that lived next door to me, she said that she remembered hearing a noise, but she thought it was wind, and she just went back to sleep. A neighbor across the street from me said she heard it, but she thought it was her granddaughter's television. So she didn't go outside, but she definitely heard it. Another neighbor that lives about a block down the street heard it. She actually got up because she thought it was a high wind, and she was worried that her trees were going to be damaged. And she was amazed that when she looked out, there were no trees blowing at all. And she remembered thinking that was really odd, but she didn't do anything else. She just went back to bed. I realized after everything was over that the whole experience had lasted about 15 minutes. When I went back in the house, the first thing I did was check my clock to see what time it was. For some reason, I did that. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any time, that I hadn't been taken or anything had happened. And the time was fine. It was good. I had been there the whole time, but it was really creepy. And why do you think that particular experience with that airy growl would have provoked that fear in you? I think mainly because I could not identify the sound or what it could possibly be. And so for that one split second, my mind was going to something unknown. And that was in the UFO category? Yes. And if any of you have ever heard a sound like that strange growling, airy growling, whatever it is, um, I would like to know from wherever it is in the world that you may have heard this. It is puzzling. And if it's into the category of uh, some of the other metallic sort of trumpet, more trumpet-like that I have recordings of from uh, the last nine years. But it is so... The, to me, the most fascinating part about this, and I uh, extend to those of you who are physicists and engineers, how can there be something so loud and clearly neighbors heard it even if they didn't get up and come out and have a kind of an oppressive feeling, uh, seem to be heavy. She had this feeling of heaviness tremendously loud and still see nothing but stars in a dark sky and that her beautiful little dog not reacting in the normal barking way and none of the other dogs in the neighborhood that normally would bark. I think all of us have at some time known where, what a neighborhood is like when the dogs are constantly barking at something moving. It is truly a puzzle, and I know that we are working with advanced technologies now in the United States, and I'm sure China and Russia are, with invisibility. But you would think that invisibility would still cause something in moving in the sky, uh, perhaps, and, and if that is a reflection of the starry sky above the craft, so that she thought that she was looking at a perfectly clear night with no wind, no breeze. She said there wasn't a leaf moving on the trees when she went out. Then how how is that even accomplished? I know invisibility has to do with reflecting uh, light around and, and then obscuring, but that is amazing. And I've heard that same description by people Uh, There was a case down in Brownsville, Texas. It was about 10 years ago, and I remember this. It was a a family in a house, and one of the um, young men just came out onto the steps 
like you would if you'd had dinner and, and you just went outside to get a, a breath of fresh air. And he said, off to his right, in the sky, nothing to obscure it, he said, it was a triangle and it was huge. And as it was moving and he was standing there in complete and total astonishment, he said, it just literally, it was there and the next thing he was seeing the sky where it had been. And he asked me, how, how would anybody do that? There, if, if there is some quote unquote simple advanced technology that we're now doing, I sure would like to learn more about it. And if we can't do that in a microsecond, if we can't take a solid matter object and seemingly have starry sky, then what's in that? Who's making that sound? Are we dealing with other dimensions? Literally a dimension penetrating this one when some of these bizarre sounds come? And if that were true, why is there no handshake? I use that metaphorically, meaning that if there are entities and intelligences that can have a technology that they can penetrate into this matter universe and then leave it and go to another dimension or another universe by frequency, by portals, whatever it is, why would there be these brief penetrations here with sound and light and all of the bizarre phenomena without ever having a global introduction independent of governments? I've always thought, why would, why would non-humans think that they had to check in with Homo sapien about landing and introducing themselves to the world. What is the stop? Unless we are somebody else's laboratory and that's why there is a rule that there's no um, public and straightforward, honest interaction with the laboratory species that is most manipulated and studied. The human form. I wonder about all of these questions all of the time, and I know that a lot of you do, and you write profoundly interesting letters. And Peggy, on that note, I would like to segue to you to learn what comments there are tonight and questions, and uh, thank you for being there. Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to say some thank yous to the Super Chats night in, a, in the chat window. So Amy Lou Moonbird, Rachel Dally Hug, Stephen Early, Mooverling Five, Terry M. Hart, and Mr. Catfish, thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. I, I uh, hear these uh, super chat lists and a whole bunch of things run through my mind and my heart. Uh, gratitude that you appreciate what I'm doing and a resonance with all of you who seem to understand that this kind of work that I have been doing for so long, it is so difficult to be a fish swimming upstream on this planet. And all of us who have tried to find out the truth, we've been like fish swimming upstream and the very fact that we're on a planet where the power brokers and the political systems want everybody to stay dumb about what they are doing with other intelligences, I think is so, so unfair. And that the more I hear from all of you from around the world, it doesn't matter which kind of political system you're in. I'm getting remarkable insights that so many of you feel exactly the way I do. We humans, as a human family, we deserve the truth about our source and what interacts with this planet. John Keel called it a haunted planet, haunted by 
so many phenomena that are never explained. And so I just want to say uh, with uh, a, a sincere gratitude to all of you who send in those super chats. Thank you for understanding. Uh, thank you for wanting me to be here. And I can't think of anything else that I would rather do. So what about more questions and comments? We had a lot of comments uh, regarding the noise. Now, some people were asking, you mentioned it was in Texas? Uh, yes, and this is... It, they were wondering where exactly in Texas it was. It like is... the north or the south? It, it's... Uh, I, I showed the map and everything, 55 miles northwest of San Antonio. Antonio, perfect. Yeah, and uh, it is a small town... Uh, that is uh, in Bandera County, and that she has uh, lived in the San Antonio area uh, really basically most of her life, knows it very well, has lived in the house and the area where she is now for a long time. And that's always important in these kinds of investigations because if people are new to an area, it could be something new. And if they aren't new, and they've been there for years like she has, then when there is something unusual like this, then as an investigative reporter, that's one of the uh, pieces of uh, putting together a report. How comfortable, how much of the environment do the people that you're interviewing know their area, as she does. And the town, it's uh, Medina, M-E-D-I-N-A, and in Bandera County, 55 miles northwest approximately from San Antonio. And we showed that other big map so that you could see that where San Antonio is beyond, and the map, that water is the Gulf of Mexico. And so she lives in a town that is inland, but is still in that arc. When you think about uh, from Houston down to Corpus Christi and San Antonio. There, there's a swath there. Lots and lots of unusual phenomena and UFO activity for decades. And some people are wondering, could, could all these noises that are being reported, could it be just be fracking and the residents just don't know? Has anybody, I'd like to know, has anybody done a surface recording with either a good professional video camera or their iPhone of fracking at work? Because from everything that I know from trying to get to the bottom of the whole huge UFO complex chess game for 41 years now, that... When I think about all the things that I have covered, and there's now about 3,000 reports at earthfiles.com and all of the previous uh, decades when I was working on projects for CNN and for Home Box Office and on and on in the media, I don't remember outside of the Taos hum that was also reported in Bristol, UK, Taos Hum, Bristol, UK. They go back, that hum, that's all they called it, a hum. And I've actually talked with an engineer who was trying to record it once in Taos and said, we're not talking about something that is uh, in your face. We're talking about something that is sort of more of a subtle hum, but can bother people at a very specific pitch. So... That is all that I was really aware of until January of 2011. That was a demarcation, some passage, some doorway that we went through because I remember that January of 2011, there were thousands of birds that died in a town in Arkansas. And then I interviewed a man who went out on a highway. There were 
thousands of birds beyond the town that were dead on the highway. They, and then there were thousands of birds in uh, other parts of the world that were being found dead and no explanation. Well, along with all of those bird deaths started coming these reports. That's why I remember it so much. It's anchored in my mind. People reporting huge loud booms that would shake their floor or they thought it came from the roof or metallic scrapings. That was the first time that I ever heard people discuss it, discussing hearing like from above in the sky, night or day. This has happened in a sunny blue sky day. And they're stopped in their tracks. I remember one woman said she had just lifted up a box out of her, uh, I think, no, she was, it was from her house. She had the box and she was going to put it into the trunk of her car. She was coming down to the car. And so she's got this box. She's really intent. She's uh, moving some stuff. It had to do, I think, with her daughter. So she's very busy and wants to get this done and get on the road. And she remembered being like this with the box to put it in her trunk. And simultaneously, she said, this was her word, she said it was like a chorus of trumpets came in the sky. I felt it was above me. I stopped holding this box of all of this stuff. I was so shocked. And she said, Linda, I immediately thought of revelations in the Bible about the trumpets of the angels opening up some part of the apocalypse. Well, those kinds of stories emerged in 2011. By August of 2011, that is when the famous Kiev it's about 9, 10, 11 minutes. Uh, it is an extraordinary, I personally think, recording by a woman who was working in a video, uh, like a video store. Well, people who listen to it and, and it's been attacked up one side and down the other, saying that she must have done this as a stunt. When you watch and listen to that recording and you look how she is searching, she's searching the ground, she's searching, and there are people who are walking down below her and they act as if they're not hearing anything. That was so weird in 2011. But by now, 2020, nine years later, because there have been so many cases where a person in a house or a person in a car or a person walking in it hears some unbelievable sound and they see maybe other people and they, they're not hearing it. And that's another one of the mysteries. Why is it that some people are hearing these sounds? Did the dogs not bark? because they weren't hearing it. Dogs have incredible hearing. What in the world was happening? Where she uh, in Texas uh, was hearing all of this loud sound and her little dog wasn't barking but was doing a low growl. And I have had enough pets in my life, including dogs, to know that when a dog is doing a low growl, they're warning it's not good, but they're afraid of something. So you get all these signals complex around phenomena that are so confusing. And I think that uh, just to cap out that 2011 was the beginning and therefore the idea that we have had uh, sounds like forever, that's not the case as far as I know, that it came We've got a 2011, and that included the booms, the sounds of like freight trains colliding with each other, the trumpets. And I would put this strange sort of airy, spacey growl in a different category. And she's not the only one apparently hearing this because she went on YouTube looking for any sound that would be like what she heard that night. 
and that is a, a YouTube from 2018, but it shows that people are hearing similar sounds, but there's never answers. So fracking, I just don't think that fracking even rises into a category of a possibility given the fact that as many of the strange sounds, whether booms, metallic scrapings, trumpets, this, this particular sound, is from around the world. The audio recordings come from both hemispheres. And there are lots and lots of places on the planet where these bizarre sounds have been heard the last nine years where there's no fracking at all. So it's an interesting question and I'm open to anybody working in the industry who wants to send me what it sounds like for a deep fracking machine to be operating and what sounds, what it, does it sound like on the surface. But it sure would not answer so many cases where there's no fracking, where there's no oil industry at all. Like uh, in the mountain areas of Switzerland where there have been recordings or in, uh, in a mountain in Norway and where they're not doing any oil uh, drilling at all. So adding to our uh, list that grows higher of mysteries on this planet and onward to another question. A viewer wonders, how concerned are you about the COVID virus? Are you taking precautions and how concerned should your viewers be? I agree with the CDC and the World Health Organization that this is now a pandemic. Historically, a pandemic has been defined by medical authorities as when a microbe of some sort is spreading on at least two continents and we are now at 40 eight countries and several continents tonight. I'll tell you what I said to my daughter, who I love to my core. I'd do anything to protect her. She has no spleen. She lost her spleen in a terrible accident in 2004. And ever since then, if you lose your spleen, you lose one of your stronger fighting something that invades your body. And I worry about her immensely. So that's the playing field upon which I'm thinking. And I recommended that they get at least a month's emergency supply of the food that all you have to do is add water and warm. I'm doing the same thing. I am, my brother is uh, bringing me a propane, uh, like a camping stove, so that I could at least heat up and boil water for using those, uh, those meals and for coffee, which I live on coffee. I have at least a month or two of bottled water in the garage. And I don't feel panicked, but I'm worried about my daughter. And I am sharing with you what I've recommended that she do. Make sure you've got a month or two of bottled water. Make sure you have a safe way without having to go out to heat water. Have uh, some kind of food that would last a month or two where heated water is all that you would need. And I think that that is a good context in which to always live because none of us know what is ever going to happen. And in this case, we have had it writ large for us since the 1st of January that this coronavirus is spreading through the air. And it is new, novel, and it is clearly coming in to some humans 
and not making them sick. And those humans that the coronavirus is going into, their host, are being called now super spreaders. There's been many of them. It's not understood. The super spreader, like the man who had gone to the conference up in the Alps, his home was in England, and he's fine. No fever, no nothing. And comes from the conference, goes back to England, and then we all learn that 10 or 12 people got really sick. And then when they trace back all of the Q&A about who had they shaken hands with and who had they been in meetings, and they all had a road to this man in England. So super spreaders have been leaving people in their wake that become really sick, and they don't. That adds uh, tension, that adds worry, because it means that you, it, the, the signals that we normally would depend upon in trying to stay away from people who are sick, that they would be coughing, that they um, might have a fever, they, if on a plane they got sick, we would know that they were sick. Well, what if you're on a plane with 100 people and two are carrying the coronavirus, and they don't even know that they have the coronavirus. And everybody else on the plane, or the train, or the bus, or the car gets exposed. So there's something about that that is an important facet to why this is spreading so fast. I had done a script last night that I had finished, I think it was at midnight, for today. And when I got up this morning, the numbers had changed going up. And by tonight, I only cut it off at five o'clock. The numbers keep going up and up and up. So even though some of the good news that at least was reported since I think yesterday for the first time that the death rate and the uh, case increase in China, in Wuhan, Hubei province, and that area that has been locked down so badly. They're saying, and I honestly don't know what to trust, but they are saying that the death rate and the case increase hasn't increased. And here is the other problem that I think if we all speak to each other honestly. What do we trust anymore? Which federal agency in the United States do we trust? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I've always trusted, and they are very, very, very concerned that this is going to get worse. The World Health Organization, None of us know the people running it, but at least in the past, the World Health Organization has been pretty accurate about its estimates for what was going to happen in SARS and MERS, and they are very concerned. In fact, I think it's the World Health Organization and some of the doctors in that who are basically saying, uh, let's not split hairs here. This is a pandemic. The world at large is involved, not just Wuhan or Hubei province in China. So what attitude should we take? I've been asking myself that. Try to make it possible to be an island, a true island, no going anywhere for a month. And when you contemplate that, nobody wants that. I understand. But the truth is that the CDC and the World Health Organization in the last 24 hours may have been the only two honest voices talking to the planet. Because the politicians are not. 
corporations are showing us by their actions that they are extremely worried. Apple at least said they were closing down uh, their iPhone uh, production chain for the foreseeable future that was in Wuhan. And it isn't just Apple. So now we got a lot of different wedges here. It isn't just what could that coronavirus, the COVID-19 do to me, you, you might be a super spreader and nothing. You might be in the 80%, mostly a cold. Who's going to be in the 20%? And the 20% is tangling pretty hard at what is happening in their lungs by this coronavirus. But 80% a cold. Wow, let's hope. It's the 20%. I don't want my daughter to be in that 20%, and she probably would be. So I understand that Gilead is pushing possibly uh, in one direction, and that there are others that are trying as fast as they can and some are saying that they think that they already have or could have a vaccine. Here's the problem. Whatever works in a lab in a Petri dish that has to be applied to a world of humans without hurting some while treating others, you have to get all of these testing. And that's why they always say it's up to a year before they would have something that would be acceptable medically to put out in the world. And what would everything look like over the next few months? I know that there are people who have been saying on television, on news, including the person in the White House, that all we need is the warmth coming from the spring and summer. Well, look at the list. Go to the world a meter and look at that long list of 48 countries. And I showed some of it in the maps. And a lot are in warm countries. And it's spreading. So when you just start put making a list, of what we know and potentially what could happen. Think about this sentence. Already by February 26, 2020, with the COVID-19 brand new coronavirus as of the middle of December or people argue about was it the middle of December or the first week in December, but not very long on this planet. And that in the lists of cases and deaths that keep going up, it has far surpassed SARS. It has surpassed MERS. So we have something that can really hurt 20% of the human population. I pray all of you here, Peggy and Eric and their kids in Canada, Mark in Florida, my family in Philadelphia, the hundreds and hundreds of friends that I feel deeply for. I hope you're in the 80%. But right now, we are on a planet where we're all going to have to think about the 20% that are going to perhaps need ventilators. And that what we don't know is why are there super spreaders? And those super spreaders are causing these counts to go up. And that means that there are so many unknowns. Hopefully, all of us can meet 
on Wednesday nights. And as long as there's hard news to report, I will keep trying to give you not huge reports, but I'll keep trying to update you on what I learn, especially on the medical side, about what uh, we're getting from real medical people about the consequences and hopefully treatments and vaccines. And that as long as you all can go through that mental exercise, and it is a mental exercise, I've been doing it for myself, could I live and continue to work because I work from my office in my home? Could you be totally separated from the world as an island for at least a month? Use that as your guide. It's not that terrible. And, and it may be that the entire United States and the Western world that has not done much protection or running exercises, um, that this might be a good thing. If everybody just tried to do that, what would you need to survive for a month without getting in your car, going anywhere, just staying where you are? How would you fend? And what about the people in your family and your animals? You have to get extra food and kitty litter and all of that to provide for your animals for a month. So you guys tell me, I'm serious. I would really like to know, is what I've been saying to you helpful without being a downer? Because I'm not trying to be. I, I really feel strongly that you try to make your life as prepared and as strong as you possibly can, knowing that things come in from the top, the bottom, left, right, that you're not ever expecting. And that if having discussions like this could help you, help me, that we're helping each other try to get through something like a coronavirus pandemic. And think about 50 million people dying in 2017, 2018. The world went through that. I don't think it will be that bad here. I don't. But we can't be afraid to talk with each other about the hard facts that might help us survive and help other people survive. So it's in that context that I'm talking tonight. And I really, really go into the chat and please tell me whether what I've said makes you feel better, makes you feel that you might have some tools that you could try or not. But I just don't think that we should turn away from trying to face what could be not so cool for a while and how we could help each other get through it. So what about one more question, dear Peggy? All I right. have a question. It's completely off uh, topic, but it's a great one. Uh, a viewer wants to know, how did the CIA ever fi find out that a human was able to remote view? Oh, wow, what a great question. You know, I don't have the answer to that. I really do not know. Um, historically, the beginning from, from Linda's point of view and what I've been exposed to, which certainly is not going to be uh, the whole answer, but Stanford Research Institute at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California is where I did my master's work in communication for two years and did documentaries for the Stanford Medical Center and for the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And uh, science and medicine and the environment have always been what I love to explore the most 
and it's how I got into animal mutilations and everything that has led to here. Um, Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, um, Ingo Swan came in there at some place, Yuri Geller came in at some place. There was a group at the Stanford Research Institute in the 60s. I was there from 66 to 68. And I think that I, not knowing anything about them then, of course, uh, I was a student. But we, we crossed in that decade of the 60s at Stanford University, which I have the impression that at least in, we'll call it the public forums of universities, Stanford was leading in that area of phenomena, a mind control, mind over matter, and what I think were remote viewing where it started. But we also know that the Central Intelligence Agency was founded in September 18, 1947, when Harry S. Truman as president separated the Army and the Air Force, and on September 18th, when he separated officially the Army and the Air Force, Truman created the Central Intelligence Agency. From everything I know, he did that specifically because of UFOs and ETs. By then, our government from 1941 had been dealing with UFOs and ETs. So by 47, when he separated the Army and the Air Force and created the Central Intelligence Agency, I don't have a document that tells me this, but I would bet that our government already had been dealing with quite a few entities, uh, or at least a few, alive who had demonstrated telepathic communication, and that this was both a challenge, this was both uh, probably like, oh my God, we have to learn how to do that, and then scary. Because if the government of the United States began to be aware before, during, and after World War II that other types of intelligences that were not homo sapiens sapiens, we're clearly here on this planet, whether in bases underground or on the moon or Mars or wherever they were based. They were definitely interacting with pilots, ships, people around this planet. They knew that. And because they got all kinds of reports from all over the place about People would be hearing words coming into their mind that would have been telepathy by the, some of those beings that they would have had to be dealing with first. And that led to, I know a program, it was called Looking for Translators. As far as I know, it was in the 50s. And our government was behind, I'll put it this way, grade school, junior high there would be a notice in the school, we're having a contest. Sign up for the contest and you will win, whatever it was. And one man uh, who has talked to me about this in great uh, detail, is he said that he was taken into a room, there was a, a slide machine, uh, two or three people, he was, uh, I believe he was 10 or 12, and they said, all we want you to do is just look at the screen and tell us what you see. Nothing more. And he said it started out like photograph of a robin. You could say bird or you could say robin, whatever it was. But okay, so he started out and he said it was like click. And he was thinking, boy, there's nothing... Nothing hard here, and then. And he said, pretty soon, the images were moving so fast that it might as well have been a film. And he said, I did the best I could. He won the contest. And the 
contest was being taken to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. So he, from his point of view, he and a lot of other young people in the 50s, uh, they were looking for people who would have a, t a gift, a, a mind gift of being able to both see, take in a lot of information and that they were, obviously they had some relationship or some match between if you could get down a lot of download of images. I know from all the people I've interviewed, if you're an abductee and you're face to face with one of the, it could be maybe AI as well, but the organic ones, I think, you get movies. You get multiple movies. They're coming through your head. They've got symbols on them. Sometimes they've got zeros and ones. Well, those movies and those symbols they were looking for people in the 1950s who could handle that kind of download. So I think at least this is a fair place to start in research that Stanford University, Stanford Research Institute, Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, Yuri Geller, uh, John uh, I, I, uh, Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan was the great, great remote viewer. And just to end up on our uh, tonight on a sort of a, a higher note that makes me feel uh, more, even more curious, I guess, about the universe and the planet we live on in spite of all of the problems that there are these amazing amazing pieces that come from the wildest places that make you wonder what kind of universe are we in. In Goswan, there was a group of us that were about, I don't know, seven or eight men, and they invited me to go to Ingo Swan. We all knew each other through UFOs. And we went to Ingo Swan's place. You were in a part of New York, and you're walking on the sidewalk, and then you went down steps and the door to get in was down below the sidewalk. So it, it was quite large once you did this. And when you went into Ingo Swan's underground place in New York, he had massive oil paintings that he had done. He, he was a genius in many ways. And we sat down at a table and he pulled out what he wanted us to see, some of his successful remote viewings for the Department of Defense and the Pentagon. And one of them was remote viewing Jupiter, the planet Jupiter back in the 60s, 70s, before we had anything out there. And he went page by page in this black binder about what it was that he was showing us how it works and how they get these impressions and, and it was all typed up, I think that one was by then. But he had seen uh, the rings around uh, Neptune. He had seen uh, all kinds of things about Jupiter, including, and I remember him showing us, someday they will find that there are hard matter mountains at the core of Jupiter, which is supposed to be a gaseous planet. And I remember him, mark my word, no matter what they argue, there are big, rocky, metallic, I think is what he said, mountains inside of big, gaseous Jupiter. So write that down put February 26, 2020, Ingo Swan to me and those guys, and Ingo saying someday they'll find those mountains in Jupiter. As crazy as it sounds, just write it down. And who knows? We're heading out into the solar system in an exciting way. This decade, if we can get past coronavirus and uh, fighting each other and doing something to help the global climate, that it could be an exciting decade. 
with more and more and more our AI getting us out to planets like Jupiter, getting down into those thick, huge, gigantic, gaseous layers, and maybe even getting down to mountains inside of a gigantic gas ball. That's what Ingo Swan remote viewed for the government, put his name on it. So mark that. A reality check, maybe this decade, on something that the talented Ingo Swan at Stanford University at SRI and working in the Pentagon and so many other places, he, he proved that the human mind has some way to